How important is morality to you? Did you know that among Canadians, according to an Angus Reid poll, an astounding 40%, almost half, don't even view the word morality as having a positive meaning? Have morals had a positive impact on your life? This is a question we can ask before even having a discussion as to what may or may not constitute proper morals. Does living with a steady code of conduct, which outlines right from wrong, good from bad, and helpful from harmful, improve or impede life? What about your neighbor? Do you hope that he or she believes in the value of morality? That before acting on an impulse, he asks himself if the behavior he is about to engage in is deemed permissible under a set of moral guidelines. Some try to argue that guidelines are not necessary, that important restrictions of conduct are self-evident, that they're common sense. As we examine the world around us, many find themselves asking where common sense has gone. Values promoted in our school systems, through the media, and publicly funded programs are different and oftentimes directly opposed to what was considered common sense a short time ago. On today's program, we'll examine the earthquake which set the stage for the modern assault on common sense. We'll look at several values which, for long periods of human history, were thought to be self-evident and ask, if we as a society can reject what we used to consider common sense, how can we ensure that what is today considered common sense is not thrown out tomorrow? Welcome to Tomorrow's World. Throughout history, many decisive turning points were immediately recognized as forever changing the course of the world. 9-11 may immediately come to mind in that regard, or the dropping of the first atom bomb on Hiroshima in 1945. We could look further back to the signing of the Magna Carta, or the first voyage from Europe to the Western Hemisphere. Other turning points are not so obvious, but looking back 10, 100, or several hundred years later, their legacy is inescapable. Let's examine one such instance, a devastating natural disaster whose tremors have resonated throughout much of the world for more than 250 years. While it was one of the most powerful and destructive events in human history, few could have imagined the impact it would have on how society thinks and acts today. In the 1700s, Lisbon, Portugal, was one of the richest cities on earth, the fourth largest in Europe, and the capital of an empire. During an NPR interview, university professor Mark Molesky described the events of November 1st, 1755 in detail. About 200 or 300 miles off the Iberian coast in the Atlantic Ocean, an enormous fault line that had been dormant for perhaps thousands of years exploded. It was the largest earthquake to affect Europe in the last 10,000 years, and its tremors and reverberations were felt as far away as Sweden, northern Italy, and the Azores in the central Atlantic. You've likely seen images of modern earthquakes on the news. Collapsed apartment buildings and caved-in hospitals and schools are images you don't quickly forget. What often makes earthquakes so deadly is their ability to cause buildings to crumble with no time for the occupants to escape. Shortly after nine in the morning, when the ground began to shake in Lisbon, the majority of the city's inhabitants would have been gathered together in the largest buildings in town, the churches. As it is today, Portugal was a very Catholic nation and November the 1st, All Saints Day, was considered an important day of worship. Many who survived the initial quake gathered near the clearings on the banks of the Tagus River. A tsunami which raced across the Atlantic hitting Newfoundland and killing people as far away as Brazil, pulled many who sought refuge on the riverbanks out to sea. Candles which had been used to light homes and as part of worship services, sparked hundreds of small fires which merged into a firestorm. Some estimate as few as 10 or 12,000 dead, while most assessments list the death toll between 20 and 40 or as high as 80 or 100,000. A poem written by the French philosopher Voltaire 
asked this difficult question. Are you then sure the power which would create the universe and fix the laws of fate could not have found for man a proper place, but earthquakes must destroy the human race? Writing for The Independent, Neil Atcherson describes the impact of Voltaire's poem. With this poem, he managed to smash a hole right through 18th century assumptions about a benevolent God and sinful mortals. Voltaire asked what many still ask today after a tragedy. If God is all-powerful and all-loving, why would he allow such a calamity to occur? Speaking at an event in Washington State, famous astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson was asked if he believed in God. In his response, he recounted the events of the Lisbon earthquake, describing it as the beginning of what we today think of as the modern atheist movement. Today, Tyson, Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, and others carry the mantle of providing a so-called voice of reason in the tradition of Voltaire. However, where Voltaire still recognized the need for a supreme moral authority, today's new atheists write off some of the founding principles of any successful society as mere common sense rather than a perfect law from a divine lawgiver. Sam Harris describes the claim he often encounters from those who believe morality requires a lawgiver. Raping and killing children can only really be wrong, the thinking goes, if there is a God who says it is. Otherwise, right and wrong would be mere matters of social construction. However, the base claim by Mr. Harris is that many of the laws exalted as divinely inspired are simply common sense rules that we could figure out for ourselves so long as the adequate effort and research was put forth. Clearly, we can think of objective sources of moral order that do not require the existence of a law-giving God. Questions of morality are really questions about happiness and suffering. While we do not have anything like a final scientific approach to maximizing human happiness, it seems safe to say that raping and killing children will not be one of its primary constituents. He proposes common sense will provide us with a sound moral code for humanity. In many ways, this appeals to our basic human nature. While the rise of secularism in society has not created rapists and murderers overnight, enough time has passed and secularism has grown to the point where it is affecting the values held by our society. In the next part of our program, we will examine a few common sense values that have been drastically altered over the past several decades with champions of the secularist movement leading the way. Values which once seemed self-evident are under constant and determined attack. But first, I want to give you the opportunity to call in and request your free copy of today's featured offer, a DVD titled Prepare for Your Future. As we see sweeping changes in the world around us, it is natural to be concerned for your future and the future of your family. This DVD contains three Tomorrow's World telecasts. These programs tackle some of the big questions, such as what happens after death and what do I need to do in order to seek forgiveness. It also refutes one of the most common misconceptions about the Bible. Be sure to call, click, or write to us today for your copy of Prepare for Your Future. I will be back in 30 seconds to discuss whether or not common sense can provide a balanced, consistent morality for mankind. Don't miss out on this exciting opportunity. Call the number on your screen and ask for your free copy of Prepare for Your Future or order online at TWCanada.org. This DVD contains three Tomorrow's World telecasts, which will help you to prepare for what lies ahead for you, your family, and the entire world. Dial the number on your screen or visit us online to get your free DVD. If you missed our contact information this time, keep watching and I will be back to give it again. Welcome back. On today's program, we've discussed a devastating earthquake that laid the foundations for the new atheist movement, which claims that good moral law can be provided simply through the use of good old common sense. 
before we get into examining some specific areas where once obvious beliefs have been devalued. Let's talk about some of the inherent flaws with this line of reasoning. If there exists a true morality, what is the likelihood that we could discover it for ourselves through common sense? Perhaps we could all agree that killing children is wrong. We'll dig a little deeper on that one in a moment. But what about the less obvious issues? Is there a time when lying is okay? With what principles do we raise our children? Before the break, we read a quote from a well-known atheist philosopher, Sam Harris, where he used the phrase maximizing human happiness in order to describe how we could put together an objective morality through a scientific approach. Drive past a bar one evening, you'll see a lot of people maximizing their happiness for a short time. What about blowing off studying for a test to go to the beach? Or going into debt to buy the latest iPhone, gaming console, or an extravagant vacation? Seems like a good way to maximize happiness right now. Will Mr. Harris' system account for what will bring us happiness tomorrow and the next day and the day after that? If the goal is maximizing happiness, would that require redistributing all goods and resources so that we all have equal happiness? How are we defining happiness anyways? Let's take a look at the fruits of our decision to decide for ourselves how to define morality. We'll look at two values that have changed drastically. Values that once seemed obvious, but without a moral authority, morality on these issues has evaporated. The value of family. Stating that the traditional family structure is a good thing didn't used to be controversial. However, to illustrate what happens when we remove a divine authority and his definition of family, I'd like to read from an article that appeared in The Telegraph nearly 10 years ago. The modern family is now so complicated, it has taken the fertility regulator 10 pages of legal jargon to define mother, father, and parent. We could only guess the additional reams of paper needed to define grandparent, aunt, uncle, cousin, brother, sister, and family pet. It is astonishing how quickly the traditional family structure has been devalued by our society. The speed at which these changes are taking place is surprising, even to those carefully studying the subject. Researchers who study the structure and evolution of the American family express unsullied astonishment at how rapidly the family has changed in recent years. This churning, this turnover in our intimate partnerships is creating complex families on a scale we've not seen before, said Andrew J. Sherlin, a professor on public policy at Johns Hopkins University. If you have a hard time keeping up with the current landscape regarding the family structure, listen carefully to this next statement. It's a mistake to think this is the end point of enormous change. We are still very much in the midst of it. Sadly, the biggest victims of the change of family structure are often children. Three in 10 children in Canada were living in non-traditional family arrangements, such as in a lone parent, a step family, with grandparents or other relatives, or as foster children. 30%, let's be clear, there are people all over the nation and the world in various circumstances who have done a tremendous job of raising children or of growing up to become responsible contributors to society despite their situation. I don't want to devalue the job that they are doing. However, it is clear that the traditional family is the optimal environment for the development and nurturing of children. This is a concept that at one time seemed obvious but is now under heavy assault and needs defending. In recent weeks, a barrage of new evidence has come to light demonstrating what was once common sense. Family structure matters. Princeton University and the left of center Brookings Institution released a study that reported most scholars now agree that children raised by two biological parents in a stable marriage do better than children in other family forms across a wide range of outcomes. Who would have thought? The best people to raise a child, in the vast majority of cases, are the biological parents of that child. The fact that this statement is controversial speaks volumes to the change in our values. When we remove the originator of morality, in time, 
those moral values are chipped away to nothingness. It shouldn't surprise anyone that family structure is so controversial. The family, far more than government or schools, is the institution we draw the most meaning from. That is why social engineers throughout the ages see family as a competitor to, or problem for, the state. What a remarkable statement. Most often, it is the social engineers who are the ones informing us that we do not need a divine moral authority. Not only do they see the family as a competitor, but those who would like to define right and wrong for you and me see God as a competitor. Before looking at our final value, which has been negated by the removal of any moral authority, I want to give you another opportunity to order our feature DVD. Prepare for your future. To request your free copy of this DVD, call the number displayed on the screen and ask for Prepare for Your Future. You can also order online at TWCanada.org. Have you ever asked, where is the world headed? Or what does the future hold for me? We answer these questions and more in our magazine, Tomorrow's World. It is also yours free of charge. Don't wait. Call or visit us online to get your free copy of Prepare for Your Future and Tomorrow's World magazine. I hope you enjoyed the rest of today's program. Welcome back. We've seen how removing moral authority has resulted in the devaluing of the traditional family. Now let's look at another value that has been greatly reduced in society today. The value of human life. What could be more self-evident than the value of human life? If we refer back to Sam Harris's objective of finding a scientific approach to maximize happiness, one must assume that an essential prerequisite to happiness is existence. Thus, a society would not need divine law to safeguard life itself. How do we see life devalued? There are two primary examples we will touch on to show how the removal of moral authority has devalued human life, abortion and euthanasia. We've covered these topics in depth on past programs, and I would encourage you to visit our website at tomorrowsworld.org or visit us on YouTube and search for The Miracle of Life and Do You Have the Right to Die? These programs devote nearly half an hour to examining each of these important topics. I will, however, mention two statistics to show how the average Canadian views these two items. Canadian attitudes towards abortion appear to be shifting, according to a new Ipsos poll, as 6 in 10 say abortion should be permitted whenever a woman decides she wants. 60% believe that the life of an unborn child can be terminated at any time during a pregnancy without any cause other than the woman's desire. Environix Research Group provided detailed findings concerning Canadians' views on euthanasia. Canadians were informed that, while euthanasia has been legal in Belgium since 2002, with an explicit request from a patient with a serious illness, a recent study found that almost one-third of euthanasia deaths occur without this consent. Despite this, a majority 55% of Canadians say they would support a law in Canada allowing doctors to euthanize. If we have currently placed such little value on life at its beginning and ending stages, can we truly say that the value of human life is self-evident? So, what can we take from all this? When Voltaire wrote about the devastation in Lisbon, wondering how an all-powerful and all-loving God could do such a thing, he recognized that rejecting divine authority would not bode well for mankind. A translation of his famous statement on the importance of divine authority reads, If God did not exist, it would be necessary to invent him. What are the fruits of rejecting God? Have we been able to define our own moral authority through basic common sense and human decency? Not if you believe that the traditional family, and life itself are important. God created mankind with a very clever mind. Unfortunately, we often use that mind to convince ourselves of things that are simply not moral. 
We love thinking up hypothetical situations or looking at extreme circumstances and try to do away with reasonable laws in order to fit our every whim. If you remain unconvinced that mankind can define a just morality on our own, first of all, I applaud you for remaining with us this long to hear an opposing point of view. Secondly, I'd like to issue you a challenge. The fluid nature of man's morality means that these trends are going to continue. Sit down and write for yourself a list of morals you believe to be self-evident. Be specific and define the terms you use. One of the ways used to degrade morality is to confuse or redefine the terms being used. Five or ten years from now, re-examine your list. I imagine a list made ten years ago would include the fact that we can tell a boy from a girl at birth. That has come under attack. That list likely would have indicated that it is wrong to euthanize our elderly. That does not fit with the common beliefs of today. In the 119th Psalm, King David gives a beautiful tribute to the law of God, extolling the virtues of the moral requirements put in place by the Creator of the universe. Therefore I love your commandments more than gold, yes, than fine gold. Therefore all your precepts concerning all things I consider to be right. I hate every false way. David did not believe he could conjure up morality from common sense. What did David believe was right? That which God tells us is right. Perhaps you are a professing Christian and you find yourself asking why so many churches today are buying into these new values. You may not realize that this idea that morality is subjective has permeated many churches. The teaching that all we have to do is give your heart to the Lord and not be subject to moral law has resulted in a moral decline in Christianity. Christ specifically upheld moral law, especially the Ten Commandments, all throughout the Gospel accounts. Let's read one quick example where a young man asks him what must be done to inherit eternal life. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Some try to argue that Christ taught commandments which did away with the ten given at Mount Sinai. But let's let him tell us exactly what commandments he had in mind. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. He quotes the final six of the Ten Commandments, which teach us how to show love towards our neighbor. While he didn't cite the first four, which teach how to love God, he certainly did not teach that those were optional. But notice that some of these commands define the morality which mankind has sought to end. Family and human life are protected by God's laws. So, is what we are seeing today the end of morality? No. As long as God still exists, then His morality still exists. He and His laws do not depend on us believing in them in order to exist. The rejection of God, however, has resulted in the slow but steady rejection of morality. If you have not done so already, please take the time to order our free DVD, Prepare for Your Future. The telecasts on this DVD cover important topics for you to understand what you need to do if you recognize the world's rejection of morality and want to prepare yourself accordingly. Thank you for joining us, and be sure to stay tuned after the program for TW Answers, where we answer your questions straight from the Bible. And come back next week as Gerald Weston, Stuart Wachowicz, and I will bring you more information about the world today and its incredible future in tomorrow's world. To learn more about today's topic, visit TWCanada.org. You can also order by calling us at 1-866-784-7895 or by writing us at Tomorrow's World, P.O. Box 409, Mississauga, Ontario, L5M0P6. You will also receive a free subscription to Tomorrow's World magazine revealing God's principles for leading an abundant and happy life while providing insight into current and future events. 
Welcome to Tomorrow's World Answers. In the New Testament, Jesus makes a statement that gives many the impression that there is a sin which can never be forgiven. What is the unpardonable sin? Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men and whatever blasphemies they may utter. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation. Many have speculated on what constitutes such a terrible violation that it can never be forgiven. What did he mean by blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? This can be confusing because in 1 John 1 verse 9, we are told by John, the closest apostle to Jesus Christ, that due to the power of Jesus' sacrifice, there was no sin that could not be forgiven. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We should also keep in mind what Paul was inspired to write about sin. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The penalty of sin is eternal death. This is a consistent message in the Bible. This eternal death is the end result of unforgiven sin. This leaves us with our question. Is there a sin which God will not forgive? If so, what is that sin? For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. This is stating that if we sin willfully, that is, practice sin as a way of life with absolutely no intention to change or to repent and seek God's forgiveness, even though we have been given understanding, then that sin will not be forgiven. Mark records the link between repentance and forgiveness. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. For sin to be forgiven, knowledge of that sin must first be revealed to the person by God's Spirit so that they know what they are doing is wrong. This must be followed by a repentance or change of behavior and seeking God's forgiveness. Therefore, the only sin that cannot be forgiven, the unpardonable sin, is the sin for which the person refuses to repent and seek forgiveness. To submit a question for the show, email us at twanswers at tomorrowsworld.org. Be sure to watch us online at twanswers.org or by searching Tomorrow's World Answers on YouTube. At our website, you can watch this and many more Tomorrow's World programs. Call 1-866-784-7895. Write or visit us online today. This program is a production of The Living Church of God.